data only came so-called uh, foreign workers and they had a lot of clusters which ruined the reputation they would have loved to be on number one right 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 sorry um, okay uh, i just want to verify the, the other properties not taken. just want to verify the other properties um are we all there now yeah we're all here okay great we're all here Oh, great. So I think, let me just share my screen. So we have a summary of um, the program once again. Okay. So can you see my screen? Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Okay. I want to... So let's zoom that to uh, we can see my screen right yeah it's it's quite visible okay so we we have um, yeah. all the panelists in yeah yeah there. i can we see have, it. we have all the panelists yeah. in there um myself there um just to share the main essence of why this webinar was um or perhaps let me just give it, let me let me run let me run let me run the presentation should be a display mode yeah. on this uh, that's the view no 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 slider there's usually a display you know a kind of a display command and it's usually on the bottom of the screen actually so if you just... the very bottom of your screen it should be somewhere like a display, like it looks like a little video camera or something. Let me see. Let me see. I don't see it. Uh, oh, it's on the lower, right the, the lower right. Yeah, the lower yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah, the lower right of your, of your screen. It's it's kind of like it looks like it. Yeah, the, the the share is actually there, and um, perhaps the option I'm picking is the is the matter. Let me. Let me see if this works. Um, it just disables. It disables the presentation F5. Oh, it came on. It came on. Okay, great. It worked. Good. Got it. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Okay, great. So that the main essence of why this webinar is because it's about time actually because um, uh, we actually got working that we had to like you know. Uh, develop a uh, what's it called um, a digital ecosystem for within which we should be able to study all the activities that interplay with that uh, word innovation and then uh, within Africa we realize that quite a lot is been happening quite a lot has been happening from all the various regions and um, because of this, it may not just be too right that um, everybody just puts their head, you know, doing what they're trying to see, what they could do, losing um, track of the fact that um, policy issues that are supposed to make these things sustainable are perhaps overlooked. And I think this was actually one of the reasons when I picked on this assignment a, few, a couple of years ago, I feel I had to do some um fine tuning in the you know you know amongst all the kind of things i've been doing across the globe with different collaborators and all of that and i think um this assignment just got to happen now and incidentally today being the may or uh, may 27th was to be the day this event was supposed to hold live physically somewhere in the united states but then uh covid 19 setting and uh, maybe your voice is breaking. Maybe oh. we can shut off our video cameras because. Okay. Yes, I think that that's a good suggestion, Professor. Yes. Um, yeah. So because I think now we know how we look. <laughs> so right. I think, I think my hair. Enough. There's nothing yeah. else to see, right? Right. Yeah. So, so I'm just gonna see if I can uh, shut off my video camera. Here. Okay. Shut off mine. Shut off mine. Okay. Mine is gone. Stop video. Okay, so that better sound. Mine, that mine, mine is also gone. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so that brought about 
we've been trying to discover that within Africa, the participation of African innovators and entrepreneurs in the overall global diameter of innovation since 2003 has been so shallow. And this, frankly, does not speak to the fact that we are not doing anything. Nigerians are working, Egyptians are working, Cameroonians are working. There are awards all over the place. Sometimes, you know, Ghanaians are doing a great job, Kenyans are doing a great job. Look at it from South Africa, from Mozambique, from um, Tunisia. And, um, but then we're trying to see how we can actually synergize. And that was actually what brought about um, the build up of um, a platform we call Innovation Bed. And Innovation Bed in itself will look at upskilling researching. It looks at researching into gaps of the society in, in the present and future and try to see what, how we can fill them. It is actually out of this that we detected the digital policy gaps that looks almost unattended. So uh, with this kind of picture, we feel if we can actually make some reviews and get experts to speak to policies um, and directions that could help the continent, perhaps um, it might be a great way to see how we can actually sustain even the little efforts that we are gaining that this little mega 6% that we see on the pie of the diameter of innovation can grow. You know, you can imagine Europe alone goes with about 45% and the rest of the world share the rest. So I think um, we can actually do a lot better. Um, following that is the idea that we are going to use um, innovators and collaborations to develop our shelter hamlets, bad societies that we already have and see how we can transform them into our expected digital economies that is, you know, the desire of the rest of the world. And I think um, Prof Nita will speak to this idea of smart connected communities on these initiatives. And um, in our past um, um, interventions, we've actually been acknowledged by the Information World, I mean the Info Poverty World Conference as a major stakeholder in Africa. As you can see, program was there, and we've actually been interacting with um, the, uh, on the Info Poverty World Conference almost every year to present with uh, Professor Amjad and the rest of other collaborators in the past years. And I think about now we're trying to see how we can firm up all these ideas. Next, I will introduce um, uh, my executive director, Global Digital Foundation, Mr. Paul McDonnell. And um, he is actually a very smart policy ex um, expert. In fact, Paul was head of European policy at the Center for Data Innovation in Brussels. He spent 12 years at um, Insurance uh, Maryland and the Insurance Industry Trade, Trade Association in Dublin and Brussels and managed the industry's response to policy, legislative and regulatory developments. And today is doing us the honor uh, to give us a, a, a keynote on the subject matter. And um, today, I permit me to share that His Excellency, the Honorable Minister for Interior, was one of our uh, past winners of um, the United Nations World Summit Awards, and he sent his regard and message to the innovation community. Um, I have first on track one. Um, I think your voice is gone, Amos. Okay. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, Amos, your voice disappeared. Um, it's good. Okay, internet. Yeah, there is a problem with the voice. Yeah, I, I can see. All right. I actually can get some internet signals about instability somewhere. Uh, can, you, can you pick me a bit about now? Now, we're, now you're good. Okay, great. Yeah, now you're fine. Okay, great. So I have Mr. Ahmed M. L. L. Subski, which is actually the, in fact, is actually a, 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 a Egyptian ICT expert. Uh, and is actually the Vice CEO of Information Technology Industry Development Agency, ITIDA, in Egypt. And he's actually the eminent national expert on the UN World Summit Awards and is also a member of the Grand Jury. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Right. Um, um, next, I have um, my professor, Charles Wadia, President Chairman in Council, Computer Professionals Registration Council of Nigeria, CPN, past president, Nigeria Computer Society Nigeria. And this uh, gentleman actually 
taught me from my childhood and made me what I am today. And I'm very proud of doing us this honor today. Well, Prof, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Um, Daniela uh, Lina Plewe, PhD. She's CEO of Operizing Global, Partner Innovation Bed, and she's also on the Grand uh, Jury of the World Summit. And she's joining us from Singapore. Um, next, our uh, very good friend, Mr. Philip Tigo, is Director for Africa, Thunderbird School of Global Management, Kenya. And um, he's also joining us from Kenya. And um, I think he's to do us um, um, some um, reporting also from Kenya on the subject matter. Thank you, Mr. Tigo. You're welcome, sir. Uh, I have my very good friend, Zoe, here on that DC. He's the CEO of Dow Technologies, WSA eminent national expert from Morocco, WSA grand jury member, partner innovation bed, and he's actually from Morocco. Great guy and great Hi. entrepreneur. Thank you. Right. Ah, Professor Amjad Omar, many times, many times there in all my issues, and he's always there for Africa. I is actually, <laughs> he's a major prof. I really wonder where to place him. He's the lead consultant on the United Nations diversity for seats, and he's on. He's actually been on project that is to, that is meant to revamp and actually actually um, kind of correct developing countries if they choose to tow that lane. And this project has been on for over a decade right now. Um, subsequently, we'll talk more. And um, I think about this stage. Uh, my keynote, Mr. Paul, if you can just uh, do us the honor of uh, engaging. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, well, thank you. And I, I must say, I mean, I'm very supportive. Your innovation bed um, strategy looks to me very, very exciting um, and a good way to engage policy and innovation together uh, in Africa. So I fully support that. Um, I'll talk, I want to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence because okay, it's well, a topic of paper. Go ahead, sir. Okay, okay, can I continue? Hello? Uh, I, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so I want to talk about artificial intelligence because I've, I've just completed a paper on artificial intelligence and Europe is at a, a inflection point with policy and, and artificial intelligence because the European Commission uh, published some months ago a white paper on artificial intelligence uh, in which they outlined a scenario for its regulation. And to summarize what they propose, the white paper um, proposes, uh, well, first of all, a, a, a very much focuses on both the economic opportunities of artificial intelligence, but also on what it sees as the dangers of artificial intelligence. Um, and the European Union is it very much in favor of what I know you describe as a sort of Manhattan project or a sort of moonshot type grand industrial program um, for artificial intelligence in Europe, whereby uh, each country member state establishes major centers of research into artificial intelligence and there is shared intellectual property between institutes, uh, which would be state funded and I think partly funded by the European Commission, um, and then also the, the European Commission itself would establish standards in artificial intelligence, which were designed to protect both, uh, to ensure both safety, that is safety in systems where it might be used in transport and medicine, but also to ensure what they see as the protection of human rights. And so they would have standards to do this. And they envisage a, 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 a single framework, I call a single framework of standards for AI that would both protect, as they see it, human rights in regards to AI, but also protect safety. Um, now, in addition to that, they di differentiate between what they call high-risk AI, which is AI that could threaten human rights or safety, depending on how it's deployed or designed, on one hand, and on the other hand, all other kinds of AI. And what they propose to do is they propose to invite developers and manufacturers of the non-risky AI, or what they call the no high risk AI, that doesn't directly impact safety or health uh, or, or, or human rights, rather. They, they propose to invite people involved in development of that kind of technology 
into the same regime as the regime that would govern the, the, the riskier artificial intelligence. And they are proposing this on the basis that this, that this would set a high standard and promote confidence in AI, which Europe can take advantage of. Now, uh, I'm not gonna put too fine a point on this, but I kind of think that this is a bit nuts um, because uh, I think that you have to make a very big distinction. Well, first of all, I think there is a misconstrual as to what AI actually is. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, I think there's a misconstrual taking place, that there's a misunderstanding taking place at the level, I think, of policymakers in Europe as to what artificial intelligence actually is and what it does. And second, I think there is, uh, there is what I think is uh, an erroneous uh, equivalence being created, a mistaken equivalence being created between AI that could cause threats to safety on the one hand, an AI that could be, what I would say is, could be an instrument for abusing people's human rights on the other. Um, and the thrust of my paper uh, is very much that uh, the, the, the difference between uh, AI that could threaten safety, so for example, something that's used in a, in a driverless bus or a driverless train, on the one hand, and how to regulate for that is very different from how you might regulate AI that could impact on human rights. Let me explain. Uh, when you have an artificial intelligence system, let's say in a bus or a car, or indeed as we now have with aircraft technology within avionics systems on board aircraft and so forth, um, clearly what's at stake is human safety. You know, if there is a technical error in an artificial intelligence system being used on a train or a car, uh, then this could injure or kill people. And if something goes wrong with technology like this, you can imagine the kind of investigation that you would have after an airline accident, where essentially the technology, whether it's the black box or the flight data recorder uh, or the flight, flight voice recorder in the case of an aircraft, or whether it's other kinds of black box, box type technology that could be looked at easily enough after say a crash on a train that used AI, it will be very easy for uh, investigators to identify the, the cause, quote unquote, of the crash. The cause of the crash will be essentially identifiable easily enough from the technology, you know, an error in the software, a problem with integrating the actual a, a technology into the hardware and so forth. In the question of human rights, however, we are into a whole different ball game. This is because, in my opinion, uh, where you can identify the cause of a breach of safety uh, that would cause a crash as being um, uh, endogenous within uh, an AI system, my, in my view, an could be used to threaten human rights, the cause of that, quote unquote, would usually be exogenous to the system itself. In other words, the actual the fault uh, or the error will typically be in the policy that adopted the AI in order to, uh, in order to uh, say, abuse human rights. And the, the big, uh, essentially, so what I'm, what I'm, what my paper is really arguing, therefore, is that it is inappropriate to apply uh, strong ex ante rules to AI that could impact on human rights or could be used to impact on human rights, mainly because uh, the existing European rules against, for example, discrimination are, all, are already sufficient. Now, I gave the example, uh, and the example was this. If you if you were to use an artificial intelligence system in a, in a bank and you were to use the system uh, to give, let's say you have a town somewhere in America and the town has black and white residents. And let's say that this group of black and white residents, there's thousands of them, and they all have the same credit score. So they should get the same rate of loan. Now, if the system, which is run by the AI is, let's say if the sake of argument is asking the black residents to pay a higher interest rate on loans than white residents, 
then you would not need to investigate the AI to find out that this was a bias, a biased behavior. It would be manifest because you'd know the credit scores and you would know the result of the loans and you'd know the interest rates. And so this is not the same thing as installing an AI system in an aircraft and making sure it works before the aircraft takes off. It's a different, it's a different kettle of fish. Um, I also think that, that and I think it's, it's a principle used in the United States in terms of regulation and legislation, which I approve of, which is that the legislation to deter somebody or the, law, the laws to deter somebody from committing any kind of an offense or a crime should always be sufficient, but should not be more than necessary to make sure that the crime is committed, uh, is, not, is not committed. So for example, if you have a case of uh, a bank which is engaging in prejudicial, let's say, you know, racially profiling their, their customers and for no reason, for no very good reason, charging, you know, their black customers a higher interest rate, you won't need to go into the AI to identify this. It will be manifest. Um, and the, the danger, the, the, my worry here is that there are two kinds of approach being taken to regulating AI for human rights. There is what I call the minimalist approach, which I approve of, and then there is the maximalist approach to dealing with AI and human rights. The minimalist approach of, of AI and human rights is that you make sure that the system doesn't do any harm. So in other words, you, you, you obviously want to identify bad coding, bad software, bad algorithms, bad data that are going to lead to discriminatory behavior. And you want to do this as a matter of good practice before the AI is created. Um, I don't believe that this actually requires a huge amount of regulation to ensure this. I think that the penalties for prejudicial behavior are already quite severe in Europe. And whether or not you, uh, you, you, whether or not you, you, you uh, used AI as an instrument to, to uh, be biased or whether you did not is neither here nor there. The offense will have been committed and you will be guilty. So it's basically your problem to fix it. Um, and, and the deterrent and the fines are, are, are quite high. But in the case of, the, 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 uh, there's another view of AI, which I call the maximalist view of AI in human rights. And this to me is far more questionable. This is a view that takes it as red, takes it as axiomatic that uh, our society is inherently biased and inherently racist. Now, on one level, you can say, and psychologists will tell you, and they will say, well, of course, everybody has bias, you know, of one kind or another. Uh, you know, people have sunk cost biases about, you know, money that they've spent, they think they've invested it. They're also biased behaviors. And there's all sorts of tribal type instincts that people have as well about their own families and their own cities and their own countries and so on. But I think there is this doctrine in the United States and Europe, which is that this is, our societies are endemically biased uh, and we can use AI to solve this problem. And this is something I do not agree with because it's, it's a very much a sort of, uh, it's very much a positivist view of rights. So we have moved at this point from this idea of do no harm, which is you know, what, what doctors are supposed to operate under, um, into this view of AI that it can solve the world's problems, it can solve bias. The problem with it is, of course, that you cannot really program AI for fairness. And that in fact, most of the uh, prejudicial behavior that will take place using AI will be very likely with AI that will be not biased in any way. The AI won't be biased, but the user will be biased. I'll give you an example. There's a very, very famous case in America whereby technology was implemented. It's called Compass, C-O-M-P-A-S. And Compass is designed to identify, it's an AI system, it's designed to identify the possibility that somebody who is a criminal uh, will reoffend, uh, or if they have reoffended already, the possibility that they will reoffend for another time. And this system is used in order to determine length of prison sentence. Now, it was found by, I think it was uh, Science Magazine, and this is all in my paper, uh, that they, they wrote a, a, an article on this, and they said that this system discriminates against black Americans, young black Americans, because 
they are being sent to jail for longer periods than is justifiable by the reality of the reoffending rate. And therefore, they are, they are, uh, the system is biased and, and racist against them. Now, in fact, this is not so simple. The system, what the system does is the system looks at all sorts of factors when it analyzes the chances of reoffending. And it includes things like, you know, were you in a gang? Have you other convictions? Have your friends got convictions? And all these extraneous details are put into this. And what they found was that the system absolutely, indeed, uh, on, in general, uh, African-Americans were being sent to jail for longer periods, um, or more of them were being sent to jail for longer periods. But of course, the reason why this was is because the system itself is designed not to give people the benefit of the doubt, because in the United States of America, in several states, there is a very strong political force that wants the streets to be safe and wants crime to be low. And so when the, when, when the US criminal justice system is dealing with somebody who has committed several offenses, they tend to not to give them benefit of the, of the doubt to these people. And so the system was used in this way. As it happens in the United States of America, uh, uh, African Americans are very overly represented uh, given their population. They are overly represented in um, uh, gun offenses and homicides, and indeed both overrepresented as victims of homicides also. Uh, so what you have in the United States of America in certain cities is you have a strong culture of gun violence and enforcement of rules using guns in markets for illegal drugs and so on, within which African Americans are overly represented. It's tragic, but it's true. And so a system designed to prevent recidivism uh, by giving longer jail sentences is going to bear down more heavily on these communities uh, where these things take place. So the question then is, uh, my point is very simply this, the AI in this case, you know, we can debate whether the policy of giving people long jail sentences is correct. The, the actual AI that's used, Compass, could be used for all sorts of different purposes. It could be used to intervene across a whole range of socioeconomic uh, points to assist people who might reoffend. you know, to spend money on them, to send them on courses, to educate them, um, to intervene, you know, uh, 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 when they're much younger, perhaps. And so it doesn't, it doesn't, the AI itself isn't the problem. You know, if we have a problem with the American criminal justice system, and the fact that you know so many African Americans are being incarcerated under it, which is which is a fact and it is a big problem, then it's probably not right to assume that there is a univariate cause. And the trouble I have with the idea that the EU is advancing of regulating AI for human rights is that it tends to assume univariate causes, and it tends to assume that bias is a univariate cause uh, of social issues and social problems. But in fact, if you want to implement, if you want to intervene in the United States to assist young uh, African American men who are who have been involved in crime, it's not simply a question of saying, "Well, we're not going to be biased against them." Okay. You know, okay. there are okay. lots of other problems that cause these problems. Uh, there are problems okay, in mental Paul. health, so on. So that that's 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 the general logic of the paper. Okay, okay Paul. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great, great. Thank you. I think that's some insights there. Um, sorry, actually we had some problem with the uh, attendees. So there were a slight delay in their joining. Uh, some of that okay. just, uh, no just got, got off your, whatever, to, to your talk. Thank you so much for those insights. I'm trying to see how we we'll just look a bit, perhaps later on we'll have enough time and just also quickly come back to you. It's a global digital foundation affair, so. Um, <coughs> Let me just say, uh, see how we get um, our next panelist, uh, Mr. Ahmed. Yes. Uh, yeah, so Mr. Ahmed, you can actually take the floor. You can share your video. I think um, the threat about the network seems to get better um, because I'm okay. sure the video would be more livelier uh, to the audience. Uh, okay, I will do. One minute. That's all right. Okay. I'm back on video. Oh, great. Uh, you know, I love that hair, so <laughs> I will oh, be it all works. <laughs>
So we'll take input from Egypt. Uh, I'm trying one minute. Uh, no I'm just sorry. <clears throat> okay. Yep. Is it okay now? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Can you see? Oh, okay. You're on. Uh, uh, good evening to everybody again. It's uh, it's my pleasure to be with these uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Um, I'll talk today about um, the issues related to the policy, uh, the governmental policies in uh, in um, encouraging the innovation in the um, time. Uh, uh, after COVID-19. Let me give you some, uh, some uh, introduction about Africa. Africa population is approximately 1.4 billion inhabitants, which approximately equal the China uh, population or the Chinese uh, people. Um, uh, Africa is the second rank in the population after China. And this population is increasing annually by 2.49%, uh, which is approximately 2.5%. Uh, 2, 2 uh, the life expectancy in uh, Africa is, um, at an average, is uh, 641 and these uh, are divided to 66 for the female and 62.3 for the males. And the median uh, age in Africa is approximately 19.7. This means that Africa is a very youth nation. Okay? Let's go to... Um, uh, the position uh, of Africa in the Global Innovation Index. The last year Global Innovation Index, which is uh, uh, 2019, the last one uh, was, uh, was uh, titled Creating Healthy Lives, the Future of Medical Innovation. To me, this was uh, some sort of predictions to what we are going to, to see in the future. Or they, at this time, have some indicators about what we are going to, uh, to face in the near future. The total uh, number of countries um, were reported in this uh, innovation index was 129. Only 30 African countries are listed in this innovation index. The first country in the rank or in, the, in, the, in this index was South Africa with a rank of 62 or 63. This means that approximately South Africa was on the half of the rank or the half of the index. Uh, uh, only 10 countries were in the first 100 countries. The rest of the 30 African countries who were um, uh, listed, the other 20 were in the last 30 countries, so that most of the last 30 countries, in, unfortunately. Uh, the top sub-Saharan uh, countries were, so, uh, were South Africa, uh, Kenya, and the Mauritius, and the top by the economic group, which is the low income, were Rwanda, uh, Senegal and Tanzania. Okay? In the upper middle income countries, 
we have only South Africa, which was above the expectation for the level of development. Okay, uh, Amos, I can send you all this, uh, all this data by, uh, by mail. Very well, no very problem. well, very well, very well. Please. Okay? Yes, great. In the lower income, in the lower income countries, hello, hello. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Okay. In the lower income countries, only Kenya is and uh, above the level of the expectation, while Tunisia, Morocco, uh, Egypt, Cote d'Ivoire, and Cameroon were in the line of the expectation. Ghana, Nigeria, and Zambia were below expectation of the development. In the low-income countries, Burundi, Malawi, Mozambique, Rwanda, Senegal were above expectation, while Tanzania, Uganda, Ethiopia, Mali, Burkina Faso, Madagascar, uh, Zimbabwe, and Niger were in the line, and Benin, uh, Rinia, and uh, Togo were below. So that the 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 the, the the landscape of the innovation in Africa is not quite good. Okay? Do something about that. What 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 can what what is what are the promising fields for the medical innovation? If we are talking about the medical innovation, which is the main theme of the the last report of the innovation index, then uh, we have, uh, according to them, the treatment and the cures as a main subject, and the sub-subjects under this subject is the genetics and the stem cell research, the nanotechnology, the brain research, neurology, and neurosurgery, uh, the new generation of vaccines and uh, immune, uh, immunotherapy, and the pain management and the mental health treatment. The other main field for promising innovation will be the medical technologies. And these under these are the, the medical devices, the medical imaging and the diagnostics, the, the, the precision and personalization uh, medicine, uh, and the uh, regenerative medicine. The last one, is the organizational and process innovation, which is the novel approaches for healthcare researchers and the new ways of delivering healthy care, something like uh, the telemedicine and, and so forth. Then what, uh, what will be uh, uh, our uh, other uh, uh, needed fields for innovation in Africa. We can talk about the artificial intelligence, the big data, the internet of things, the smart digital equipments, the robots or robotics, and the augmented reality. Let me take the, the last four and I will concentrate in the last on the artificial intelligence and the big data. If we are talking about the Internet of Things, then we need to talk or we need to concentrate our efforts on the sensors. These sensors are used for getting the, or measuring the, the temperature or something like that. And also we, we need to have a, a patient tracking bracelets and many other Internet of Things application and, uh, and devices like the, 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 the IP cams, which is also uh, reads the temperature of the people or taking pictures of the people for comparing and a lot of uh, application we are facing now. So that in Africa, we need to have or to or, or to direct the innovation toward these fields of innovation. 
if we are to uh, if we are talking about the smart digital equipments then we are working uh, or uh, concentrating on uh, all uh, smart uh, applications in the medical equipments in the uh, also uh, building management systems we need to have a smart equipments which eliminate the contact of the human being in using it we we, we all know that a great part of uh, transferring the, the the disease is uh, using the, the the surfaces by more than a body somebody can be uh, or can uh, carry uh the virus and other guy or uh, or uh, or a woman or man or a woman can uh, get in touch to the surface and get uh, the virus from this so that we need smart and digi digital equipments which can be used through uh, the mobiles through any application which is a preparatory of uh, the, the user so that you can use the elevator without touching its buttons you can use open the car you can use uh, open the doors especially in um, the hospitality uh, industry like uh, the hotels and something like that instead of using the cards which uh, which uh, you are taking from um, the, the the front desk or something like that you can download an application and use all uh, the facilities of um, your uh, you, of the building you are staying in uh, as a hotel or you're in your uh, business building uh, if you are working in a company or something like that with smart uh, applications we can go to uh, the robots. Robots now become more important. And we all remember the early days of the COVID-19 when we all saw a lot of uh, videos or clips coming from China and now uh, from uh, India. They are using robots to deliver um, medicine to deliver uh, uh, food and beverage uh, to the uh, uh, patients without any human intervention from the supporting uh, the supporting staff of the hospital, and this also eliminates a lot uh, the the contamination and eliminates the transfer of virus to uh, an adult. Also, we can uh, use these robots in the pharmaceutical uh, places or in the pharmacies to deliver the medicine uh, to the patients or to the people uh, dealing with uh, the pharmacy instead of uh, giving the uh, or using the human intervention with uh, the other people. Of the, the logistics industry so that you can use uh, uh, or you can receive your parcels you can receive your parcels or you can dispatch uh, letters or parcels to other uh, to other to, to your customers using robotics instead of sending a human being to deliver these parcels also, um, uh, we can have uh, uh, augmented reality uh, applications, especially in the theater, uh, operation theater in the hospitals, to get the whole record of um, the patient instead of having uh, unsafe uh, devices. Well, 
Welcome, Professor Charles Wadia. Yes, I'm online. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. So, uh, Thank you so much. Mr. Med is just trying to round up, sir. Okay. Hello. 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 Do you hear me? I can't hear you. Amos, I can't hear you. Can Emmanuel, you, you want your, your, your microphone's off, Emmanuel? You're on mute. Oh, sorry, please. Um, Mr. Med? Mr. Med, can you hear me now? Mr. Med, can you hear me now? I hear you, yes. Okay, great. Please, can you just make a statement? Let's just close it so that we can take the next track, sir. We'll still, we'll still come back to you. Uh, uh, when did you uh, lost me? <laughs> no, 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 we didn't off you. I think it was just the next walk. Let's just summarize, sir. Sorry. Can you hear me? Okay, so that... Uh, Yes, I can hear you. So okay, that the, 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 uh, the, the artificial intelligence can enable the doctors, the hospitals, uh, to, to, to boot the, the management of the hospital, to, to uh, encourage the doctor or give the doctor more uh, flexibility in diagnostics or something like that. should create the enabling environment for encouraging the innovation in the six past uh, uh, tracks, uh, the, the common tracks in and, uh, and also in the medical uh, innovation. So that creating this environment by uh, by uh, by the law, the legal, uh, the legal, uh, or the legalization, issuing legalization, by uh, by putting uh, the rules and regulations for uh, data privacy and for uh, and also enabling the the, the security for uh, the systems, uh, which most of it or all of it will be a digital system, so that a lot of uh, the the the. the the policies are needing uh, in that area. Also, the, 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 the government can create the proper innovation infrastructure or what I can call the innovation infrastructure. What is the innovation infrastructure? Number one, what we are calling the innovation clusters so that the healthcare is a cluster and there is a sort of uh, a sort of uh, uh, ecosystem for this healthcare infrastructure or, uh, or healthcare cluster that the, the, the government should create it to enable the people who, uh, to complement each other and not to redundant each other. Also, the, 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 the government should uh, uh, give the opportunity for or uh, put the policies and regulations to encourage training and education in the field of 
uh, in the fields of uh, related uh, related tracks we, we, we mentioned before. And at the end, the, the, the government should create the investment schema and the, the financial schema needed for the innovators and the entrepreneurs to work and to have or to have uh, products in uh, the last mentioned fields. I think uh, this is in a nutshell uh, what uh, the government should do uh, to encourage the innovation uh, after uh, the COVID-19, especially in the healthcare sectors and uh, its supporting functions. Hello? Yeah, we too. We're with you. Do you hear me? Yeah, we're with you. Can you hear me? Very yes, well, I very can well. hear you. Yeah, I absolutely. finished. We can hear you. We can hear you. You're good. I finished. You asked me to uh, to to summarize. Oh, great, great. And I wrap that. Oh, great, great, Mr. Ahmed. Thank you very much. That's Mr. Ahmed uh, Sopke from Thank Egypt. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, um, thank you. Uh, next thank track, you. next Thanks. track, almost automatically. Uh, Prof. Professor Charles Wadia. Uh, the president, chairman, and council, Nigerian uh, professionals uh, registration council. It will also take will take um, the next track now. Um, please, um, before we move on, we'll try to see how we can actually work. To, long time we can target the timing so that I'm sure there will be a couple of changes one or two minutes after this after this talk. So, Prof, thank you so much and welcome, sir. Hello? You're welcome, sir. Hello? Am, am, I, am I online? You are on, you are on. You are on, sir. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. On. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Charles Wadia, the President, Chairman in Council, Computer Professionals Registration Council of Nigeria, CPN. Uh, my sincere thanks to Amos Emmanuel <laughs> inviting me to this forum. Amos, I thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. Appreciate, sir. Appreciate. Thank you. I so I thank and congratulate uh, Global Digital Foundation, Programmers Foundation, Programmers Software Limited, <laughs> uh, other organizers. Thank you so much, sir. First, for their wonderful works in ensuring that Africa has a voice in the global digital policy innovation space through their various interventions in the innovation bed Africa. Second, for their vision and foresight in putting this forum together at this very critical period of COVID-19 pandemic in modern history. I recognize other panelists, uh, the audience, many of who are promoters, champions, and indeed combatants and warriors in the ICT ecosystem in Nigeria and Africa. I bring you warm greetings from the Computer Professionals Registration Council of Nigeria, CPN. Uh, my discussion discussion here will be from that uh, viewpoint, from the viewpoint of what CPN is, what it does, and uh, what it has done and uh, plans to do in this pandemic and uh, post-COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that is going to be the thrust of uh, my discussion. CPN was established by Act 49 of 1993. It is a regulatory body charged with regulation, control, and supervision of the computing profession and practice in Nigeria. It is a quasi-government agency. 
and uh, it has quite a number of uh, responsibilities and functions. Uh, in particular, CPN determines the standards of knowledge and skills to be attained by persons seeking to become members of the computing profession. It also improves those standards from to time as circumstances uh, permit. And uh, consequently, it is the responsibility of CPN, among many other activities, to organize, control, and supervise computing practice uh, in Nigeria. Screening of individuals seeking to be registered members of the profession, ensuring high quality professional ethics standards, creation and sustenance of local and international contacts, among uh, our responsibilities. COVID-19 has been as disruptive as it has been deadly and devastating, as other panelists have already mentioned. The world as we knew it some months ago has changed. Perhaps that change will be permanent. A new social economic world order is gradually emerging. Vision plan will complement strategic planning. And our interest is that Africa, Nigeria must work towards being active participants in this new order. The advent of COVID-19 has impacted the policies of uh, CPN in ways never imagined. Uh, and uh, in the popular parlance, new normal is being defined and created for CPN. One of the hallmarks of uh, professionalism is uh, training and retraining given the fact that skills, especially ICT skills, knowledge and technology are highly dynamic and that they need to be updated on a regular basis. In this direction, CPN has put in place a platform for what we refer to as a mandatory continuing professional development pro programs and uh, making it a prerequisite for the renewal of license as the professionals. These programs, as a matter of policy, statutorily are rotated among the, the different geopolitical zones of Nigeria, just for political inclusion. However, in the last two months, these programs have been held online. And that's uh, not part of, it's, it's actually not written. It's not written in any of our guidelines. Similarly, our annual flagship IT assembly program encompassing inducting new members, professional seminars, the annual general meeting, all of which traditionally hold in the capital city of Abuja. These activities are slated to hold online in the next couple of weeks. Also, in the last six weeks, I, as a president chairman in council, have had to summon an emergency council meeting on the matter of urgent national importance. The meeting was virtual instead of being held in Abuja. Increasingly, digital communication, electronic, virtual, online learning 
e-government are becoming the new normal instead of default platforms for CPN. CPN, therefore, needs to craft policies to guide the development of frameworks that address key concerns on access, costs, inclusion, security, and privacy of data. In order to broaden the scope of our e-learning contents, we are already seeking collaboration with some international bodies for sharing of contents in a mutually beneficial manner. We are also in the process of rewriting our policy on professional examinations in order to gradually migrate from traditional mode to automated method of examination management. Part of the lessons uh, learned during this pandemic is the need to strengthen the curriculum of professional courses, programs, and certification, especially in subject areas such as data science, artificial intelligence and robotics, machine learning, multimedia and video games, ICT in public health. According to the International Labor Organization, ILO, the lockdown measure to date, both full and partial, are now affecting almost 2.7 billion workers, representing about 81% of the world's workforce. Indeed, the ILO estimates that, estimates that about 1.25 billion workers, representing almost 38% of the global workforce, are employed in sectors that are currently facing a severe decline in output and high risk of workforce displacement. As such, an important component of efforts to tackle the long-term impact of this crisis, there needs to be structured, structured approach to help everyone in the workforce navigate these new realities of the labor market. And for CPN as a professional, but by extension, well, what we need, really need to do is then to see how we can steer prospective graduates to areas of need. This, of course, is a very big challenge to us, and uh, we believe there will be need to retool and reskill our members. And of course, uh, put those who are graduating and those who are already on the job. Of importance also is the need to develop open access repositories for public health education to be, held on, on, to be held available on multimedia, radio, television, internet, social media, and even uh, the traditional means of uh, disseminating information, perhaps using town criers. Further, CPN is currently developing an open access online repository for basic digital literacy as part of our efforts in educating citizens. The AI doc, Europe document, uh, which I've gone through, appears futuristic. However, the future is currently here with us as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to impact negatively on almost every aspect of uh, the human race. Contact tracing apps deploying AI technology have been used in some countries to identify persons who may have been exposed to a person or persons infected with COVID-19. We have also witnessed robots powered by AI 
being used to fight COVID-19 while limiting the spread of the virus among the front healthcare workers. So in fact, AI Africa is certainly desirable. Adoption. Taking cognizance of our social, cultural, economic uh, circumstances. Mr. Chairman, sir. Hello, sir. Mr. Chairman. Sorry, sir. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, sir. We can hear you, sir. We can hear you, sir. My, my parting message. Thank you very much, sir. My parting message to Africa, to Nigeria, is first, Africa, Nigeria should seek the kingdom of education. We must invest massively in education, leveraging on ICT. If we do this, other things will be added. I want to thank you for this uh, opportunity to share my thoughts on this. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much. Um, we, we are quite happy to take this uh, note from the President and Chairman of Council, CPM. Thank you very much, Professor Charles Wadia. Um, next on my thank you. Thank you, track, sir. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, next on my track, we have a very strong Amazon, all the way from late night Singapore. She's quite itchy, and um, Daniela Alian Aliana Pliwe. Uh, Pliwe sounds African, uh, but um, I understand she's originally German, but Singaporean. <laughs> Today, she's doing us this honor. Great innovator. So, madam, you can share your screen and do us this honor the way you love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amos. Um, so, can you see me? Um, please share your screen. Yeah, trying to. Uh, yeah, doesn't work. I think you should um, also facilitate. I have some slides that I can share the slides. I still have host this. Disabled attendee screen sharing. Okay. Um, okay. I shouldn't have that problem. Um, change. Make host. I let also cannot let, let, right let me see. Yeah, oh, yeah. great. Are you? Okay, great. Please go ahead. Fire on. Yeah. Let's see if we can share, share the screen. Um, so, can I, I? I think you need to allow that I can share my screen. I cannot right now. Uh, just click on the we green can, button. We can see your screen. We can see your screen. Uh, oh, you can. Great. Yeah. Okay, then let me go here. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Amos. I think I meant I meant we can see you, not your screen. Hang on a second. Uh -huh, There's a button at the bottom that says "Share Screen." It's it's beside the chat on the bottom of your, on the bottom of your picture. Uh, I, know. I know, but it says uh, who can share and only host. Is clicked. So I cannot. I just you. made you. I just made you a host now. I just made you a host now. Maybe it. Can you now see my screen? Sorry. Um, oh, only me, right? Well, I, I just made you a host now. Let me see. I think we have it. Oh, great, great, yes, great. You're welcome. 
So can we just do this one of 10 minutes? Is it possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Let's see. Um, so you can see this now, right? The, Great, yes, let's see. But, yeah, okay. I would like to share um, a project which um, uh, I had the great honor and pleasure to work with uh, uh, Amos together on. And what we set up um, is on this website, basically uh, one of our operating systems. And I want to show you quickly um, how that um, works. I have two parts. Um, first one is about this project. The second one, I'd love to share some not academic, uh, relatively unstructured thoughts, which I gathered from my time at the National University when I was lecturing innovation and um, entrepreneurship. So um, just quickly, first, as a academic turned business uh, person, um, my or our mission is actually to turn possibilities and opportunities on tagline. And how we want to do it um, is by setting up a network of online platforms, technology, where users, organizations, institutions, governments can actually share opportunities for various um, purposes. We are active right now. I think we may not be able to see that. They're active on various parts of, in various parts of the world and especially also in um, Africa. Um, so, and if you go to Amos' website, you will actually see since a couple of weeks um, uh, one link, or actually in the main menu. Um, something which uh, is coined Innovation at Africa and Opportunity Gateway. Right, Amos? That was your title. Um, You're right, our, go ahead. Our aim is to facilitate basically a platform for startups and allow them to, so here you can see this, um, a database for African startups is the short version. Um, why do we think this is important? So this is uh, here a little bit about what we offer. Yeah, basically building a community, helping people to connect to each other. Um, here is how it looks, and I'd love to encourage everybody um, after this session or some people in the audience to really browse there and uh, join us. Um, I think it's a great project and we can also reach out to other regions in Africa, right, um, Amos? Very well, very well. We, we, for now, have startups in these sectors, or we, we would love to have, not all are yet still, yes. but this is the, the vision of, um, I think, for, right, uh, Amos, the vision is to really fill this up, inspire people, and let them connect for the various purposes. Very so well, can, very well. It can be even, um, we all know um, ideas need, need all sorts of capital, not only economic capital, we also need um, social capital, we need know-how, I'll come to that uh, in a moment. So the vision is that this can happen on this platform. A little bit about my, our organization or um, the Horizon Gateway. So um, we basically give these gateways away also to other organizations. So if one of you is interested to have our database, which is just a feed, in other words, just one line of code um, on your website, which links and provides actually your own database under your name, your brand, everything under your control. However, it is part of the global ecosystem where we all can connect and share opportunities. I chose deliberately this vague word and overused word of opportunity because I love to, or I, I'm, I, I'm excited to think not only, and as I say, it's about money, it's about investment. It can be anything. Yes, um, here are a couple of teachers I don't need to share. Here is why join us. And I say that in this context, join Programmers Foundation 
um, and come on, on board there. Just quickly, here is um, another uh, platform. It's called uh, uh, Rwanda Gateway. Um, we did that for the Rwandan High Commissioner, and it's basically an effort around nation branding. So again, if someone in the audience or here in the panel would like to highlight this region, we are happy to give you one of these databases, and and on that you have, a, or with that you have a tool to actually steer open innovation, steer ideas, um, which which hopefully help um, the people uh, uh, around you uh, or in your uh, region. So next, um, I said earlier, um, I I. I, or I must say that I'm, I'm from Germany. I'm 15 years here. The first, 12 years. <laughs> the first 12 years, I was actually at the National University. I have a background, Paul. You will maybe resonate with that in philosophy. <laughs> and um, I always love to reflect about uh, or on, on actually crea creative thinking and how does innovation really happen from a philosophical point of view. Now, we all know this will not be um, in the next few minutes, no worries. But let me let allow me to share completely unstructured a couple of ideas which I all which I learned here or which I which came to my mind while lecturing here in Asia, which may not be applicable to um, Africa. We don't know that, right? So what I found interesting is innovation. At the end of the day, I believe there is one brain. Actually, there is one brain with a new thought. That doesn't mean there can be other brains with also thoughts. And of course, they interact and we stand on the shoulders of giants and so on. But so often we need, I think we shouldn't forget that it's incredibly fragile and it starts with a thought and thinking. Innovation starts with thinking. That means we need peace of mind. We need a peaceful environment. We need a quiet desk, things like that to actually really um, of, uh, uh, that that is pragmatic, but I think from a policy angle also we need to not forget how fragile actually um, this uh, this whole um, thing. I think my my slide here jumped back. Um, next thought is um, and I rush. I rush. I hear you. Very well. Um, vagueness. I think a culture of vagueness is actually something we could maybe think about in the context of innovation. Why? Oh, yes. Because we have market, we all know there are online platforms, and I just told you our current project. So digital media per se foster real cut boundaries. That's the definition of digital media, yeah? zero or one. Vagueness and innovation, I think, is. Um, are very tightly connected. Every early thought is incredibly vague. The short version, what I want to think, and as I say, we can discuss another time. I believe technologies will actually move forward into this, what I call the possibility space, in that space of vague. If you can manage to do that better than others, will actually be more creative and maybe more innovative. How can we facilitate the, and embrace vagueness, which so often, and many of us here at IIT are professors and academics, it's not per se a virtue. We know that. But there is one acceptable version about a version of vagueness. And that concept we are very familiar with as academics or anyone. It's, it's actually abstraction. Abstraction is, a, and we know that is a powerful tool of cognitive activity and powerful tool also in science. There is no coding without abstraction. What the computer programs do is actually relate abstraction to each other. Um, Operizing initially, my motivation was actually to create also an idea there. Yeah. Um, because as I said, and I'm not crowdfunding, not when it's already defined as a certain project, you have a fancy video. No. How can we really, in the face of what is called ideation, philosophers have a lot of other words for it, um, but let's use this 
design thinking and ideation. Um, how can we actually let people and encourage and empower another fashion world than there to connect? That was part of the vision of Operate. And I'm so happy to, to now actually, even though we call it a, a, start, a database for startups, but I think we are very open to do also what is called inno open innovation and maybe later push it even to encourage people who have a vague idea, connect to someone else and maybe someone can do. Because all, my, all these platforms are about existing services or products. They are not about possibility space. You get my point. So I believe oh. that dealing with vagueness is incredibly interesting and, and cognitive skill. We should encourage policymakers, and that's, that's something you can do. Last point, no, no stress, um, is actually methodological thinking, right? And um, we have here, I read a false paper, I was very um, fantastic, uh, solid, intellectual thinker. I, yeah, I love it. Um, Philosophy of science, I feel, is a shortcut. It's barely taught at universities, but there is something philosophy of science which I always advocate we should put on the curriculum of universities and maybe even schools. We should teach children the, the shortcut part in, in a thorough way how to think. And and there are disciplines, as I say, uh, philosophy, science, um, the other thing is which, which we be prone to, to use it that way is technology per se. Because technology forms with every interaction you create a mental model. So if we create that very carefully, we can immediately educate people to think in proper categories, to think in proper processes, and so on. It's very powerful, it might be also dangerous. Uh, abstraction, I already said something, and um, AI um, is a meta methodology. I feel I, feel I did logic based the AI that is not the data driven uh, approach we heard uh, mostly of. I think the problem thank is you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's round up. Give thank me you. one last piece, the last slide. Yes. That's right, that's right. Um, Go ahead. Communication, and I observed that here with my Asian students and also with the people I work with, um, incredibly important. We all, I give you an example. So often people go silent, and silence is ambiguous. We don't know is he working, is he not knowing, is it a no one answer, and so on. I think we all know what I mean. So, communication skills are, I think, fundamental as well for innovation. So here is a little bit of this at the other end, but I wanted to show you, I think my team is um, Please, this is my, our, our free offer from programmers. So if you would love to have uh, also a connect to our database, please, please let me know and I'm happy, uh, we are happy to facilitate. And thank, thank you so much. Th thank you so much, Daniela. Thank you, thank you, Daniela. <laughs> thank you so much, thank you so much. That was a nice thank one. You, thank you, you, thank you, great one. Thank you so much. Just gonna stop sharing your screen. Yes, yes, it's fine. Merci. Yeah. Um, so right next, I I will click on my friend, Mr. Philip Tigo from Kenya. Mr. Tigo. Yes, hi, how are you? Yeah, how are you? So I please, please I can hear you very well. So a little change. So please, immediately after Mr. Tigo's um, talk, we're gonna have Professor Amjad Umar to do his talk because he had some other pressures of some of the other meetings. And um, we wouldn't obviously want to miss uh, Amjad's talk to Africa today. <laughs> Thank you so much. So Mr. Tigo, your floor. Thank you so much, uh, the host. I think um, I will say very little because a lot has been covered. Excellent, uh, by excellent. The uh, <laughs> so excellent. I think the, basically so I'm Tigo, I'm based in Basin, Arab Kenya. I'm the director for Thunderbird School, which is part of Arizona University, but I also uh, have other positions advising the presidency in Kenya uh, and a couple of governments. So I think uh, uh, the, 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 the quick thing in terms of the context, I think, is that um, COVID-19, as you've seen, I think has affected um, global health, well-being and economies of people. We are seeing the kind of potential impacts on every sphere of life, whether it's how we live, learn or work. Uh, and most of us are in a form of a stay-at-home order. I think um, 
what we are seeing is that also uh, COVID-19 and the joke was that uh, if anything had forced anybody to digitize, what was it? Was it your government? Was it your policy? Or was it COVID-19? And everybody agrees uh, that COVID-19 made uh, countries digitize almost overnight. Excellent. Um, Excellent. And, and therefore, um, the, but unfortunately, the, these transformations were done uh, without about policy enablers or oversight. So we've seen that, and that's why I love this webinar to the extent of, of we're talking about policy. Uh, the other bit, of course, I think is that um, even before the pandemic, Africa was playing catch up to technology, um, where we were seeing larger companies um, uh, like Facebook, Google, we we're seeing a lot of issues around data privacy, data protection, we we're seeing issues around intellectual property rights to the many innovators that have been mentioned here. And so the challenge is that with COVID-19, these issues are there because it's kind of exasperated. And so um, where is the place of the innovators? Uh, I think in Africa. The other bit that I think that has been really a policy failure has been simply the lack of investments in what we call the basic infrastructure that enables technology. Um, increasingly, we say we're in the fourth industrial revolution, but if you look at Africa, a lot of our countries are really in the second and the third. Well, we haven't really invested in electricity. We are still having challenges with that. We haven't invested in ICT or that infrastructure, whether it's broadband, or access to, to connectivity, but also the cost of connectivity. And so I think for me, this whole idea of how do we talk about innovation without necessarily talking about the brick and mortar uh, aspect uh, of that. And, 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 the, and I think Paul or somebody mentioned um, the countries that are leading around technology innovation index, if you look at it, it's really those kind of investments, whether it's Kenya, South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, or Senegal, it's been countries deliberately investing, and Rwanda, if I, if I, if I miss that, it's countries deliberately investing in technology infrastructure, but not less infrastructure on energy, power, but also people and talent. And I like mentioned issues around um, education. Of course, uh, you, you can't talk about uh, technology innovation uh, in abstract, out of the policy space. Um, we are seeing the, the sector that is really not adopting technology quick enough is government. Uh, and so how do, how do we talk about policy and policymakers who do not necessarily also understand the sort of nooks and crannies of technology innovation? And so I think for us, the push also has been that how do you ensure that um, you adopt it, then speak about it. So how does government and public service, or public sector adopt technology innovation? Uh, we talk about technology innovation, of course the engine of that beyond the internet is data. And, and we've seen uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with, with COVID-19, uh, the sort of, uh, sort of uh, we say the sort of the emperor is, is naked uh, to the extent that we have not been investing neither in our health systems or neither in our data systems within, within the health sector. And so you see now this uh, plethora of, 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 of contact tracing apps that are, that are actually are flaunting any privacy regulations. There's nothing that is, is guarding that. Uh, we are seeing um, us just not being able to, to sort of handle the pandemic simply because of our data systems are not an agile. We are seeing now a rush to buy ventilators. We are seeing a rush now to hire medical personnel uh, simply because we don't know where our health workers are. Neither do we know the pipelines. Of, of who we are training and coming into the health system. Uh, somebody mentioned, I think, yesterday that unfortunately in Africa, our, our largest um, sort of talent is in the diaspora. Um, we have Kenyans, Nigerians, Ghanaians running uh, London, uh, New York, or uh, DC and, and, and LA. And so I think it's to the extent of how do, we, how do we look at, yes, innovation, but then the talent that sustains that. Because um, if you look at COVID-19, uh, we must look at it in three pieces. And if, if Ebola was anything to go by, uh, we must look at uh, the current phase, which is, which is a response. We must look at recovery, which is more or less, is how do we strengthen our systems? And look, we must look at resiliency, is how do we ensure that any other pandemic in whatever form, we can be able to manage that. Um, and so I think our technology for sure is going to be with us because we are now in a technology enhanced world. A prof mentioned that we are, yes, the world has changed, but also when the world is changing, how do we ensure that technology innovation and the, and the, and the ecosystem that sustains that is resilient? And resiliency means, to Paul's point, how do we ensure that it 
it captures issues of human rights, issues of inclusivity, because then at this time we're seeing what is happening across the continent, where there's an increase in gender violence, uh, technology is being deployed without recognizing that a majority of the population is poor, do not have access. We have issues of persons with disability or, or, or a larger population that is illiterate and, and can not necessarily grab, is sensitive to the realities of the continent. Of course, layering that with data protection, uh, privacy, but also how do we ensure that democracy in itself, uh, because I think the internet and technology is, is actually a product of democracy in terms of how it's open, but also how its openness is the ones that has enabled countries like Africa, for instance, even to access this infrastructure that was largely military to remain open. Uh, and, and I take uh, Paul's point again, because uh, we have to look at safeguards around personal data. We have to look at a new word that we're calling around algorithmic accountability. How do, how do these uh, technologies and innovation make decisions in a very transparent way so that citizens can be part of that uh, particular, particular conversation? So I have a couple of takeaways um, as, as I wrap up. I think one is that um, the world has changed and, and, and definitely we are not going back to December 2019. But also it's an opportunity for strategic refresh, I think, in terms of how we strengthen democracy using technology uh, and innovation, but also how we ensure that the process of technology innovation benefit our innovators. Uh, we mention a lot of our innovation index, but I will tell you from the ecosystem that the majority of those who benefit from technology innovations are not Africans. Uh, a lot of these companies are fancy, nice names, African names, but are not run by Africans. And even if they're not run by Africans, then we're in a situation where we can actually co-create, but then the proceeds are equally shared uh, based on recognizing intellectual property. Uh, the other bit of, of course, I think for me is, is, is kind of understanding that uh, how do we ensure that uh, we think of universal design? That because we're African and because we can iterate and, and, and innovate, or ideate, then how do we ensure that a lot of these tools and technologies actually are inclusive? Uh, work for smaller and medium scale holders, and that's why I love the, the platform that has just been shared by Daniela, to, to the extent of how do we begin to, to bring in the informal economy? Because all we are seeing, uh, of course, from the West, is stimulus packages for big companies. Uh, Africa is largely informal. Uh, I'll just add another data set, uh, which is 85.8%. So how do you ensure that this new normal actually recognizes the majority of people, either the small and medium scale enterprises, smallholder farmers, or people who, who do not work in the formal economy? And so how do you ensure that we're inclusive? I think the third, the, the sort of final bit, I think we must think, we must think of resiliency. Uh, as much as there's expediency right now, uh, we must think of anchoring a lot of these things in policy. And if we have to train policymakers, I always say we need a finishing school. Uh, for policymakers, because these things are not obvious. So how do we collaborate at the continent level to ensure that um, we actually uh, skill, reskill, and upskill everybody um, across the ecosystem so that we can be able to harness our technology innovation so that the process of technology innovation are actually uh, equal, because that is what policy does. It creates an, an equal playing ground. Um, and and, and uh, yeah, and I think I'll, I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Tigo. Thank you very much. Wow, okay. Fantastic. So at this point, at this point, I mean, I love the last one that you put in there, that the kind of measure people see may not be the African measure. It's not truly the African measure. I think that's, I think that's a very good one. Um, at this point, please permit me to accelerate a little bit to Professor Abjad Umar, um, lead consultant at the United Nations ICD for Seeds. Uh, and, um, Wow, we can't do, obviously we can't deal this in the webinar session, but Prof, just try, thank you. <laughs> uh, hello everybody, uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yes. absolutely. Uh, okay, and can you see my slide also? Very well, very well. Yes, yes. 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 Okay, okay, wonderful. So let me just make it a bit bigger so that everybody uh, can see this. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. I greatly uh, enjoyed the discussions, especially uh, the one from Daniela and also the previous gentleman who talked about some of the several of the challenges. Uh, so let me uh, talk about 
uh, some of the work that we are doing with the United Nations, I have that uh, Amos is, my very good friend Amos is very well familiar with and has been a partner for a number of years. Uh, and what we are working on at present is the computer-aided strategic planning for COVID in developing countries. And I know that, uh, you know, there are a lot of discussions about COVID, and, but many of them are focusing on the problem space. And what we are doing is moving solution. on to the solution, solution space. space. Yes. Uh, so there are lots of problems. We all know that. Um, but question is, how can we uh, come up with tangible solutions that yeah. actually address those problems systematically? So what I am going to mention is a very small effort. Uh, it's a modest effort, but it is an effort uh, that uh, I think is uh, significant uh, in trying to put all the most of the pieces together. So let me start by first of all mentioning that the objective of the UN ICT First Partnership uh, at UN uh, is to use uh, information and communication technologies to, uh, to address three major areas of work. Uh, number one is to help save lives. That is the most important area of work. And as it was mentioned previously, that how robots are being used in, in labs where the health of the, of the workers is not <laughs> you know, at risk because um, by using robots, they can, and they can do the work uh, that was being done by the healthcare workers. And so there are lots of uh, applications of ICT uh, to directly help save the lives. Um, in um, by using um, by supporting healthcare services, the second uh, significant area is that of respond and uh, uh, and help control uh, the virus by supporting uh, different type of initiatives, including the World Health Organization operational plans that they have published. They're very comprehensive plans about how you can uh, quickly respond and help control the spread of viruses in different places. And the third part is rebuilding and transformation. And by the way, that in also uh, include, as, as it was mentioned, uh, the resilience part of it. So uh, those three to four areas are our main area of work. We are not focusing on one. We are focusing on all of them. And as you can see, that's, the challenges are huge. This is like trying to build Rome in one day, which simply <laughs> cannot be done. But, uh, but uh, our approach is very modest, as I am saying. But our idea is to use a tool that we have developed as a computer-aided planning tool uh, to try to use it as a factory to rapidly generate the needed artifacts that address all of these three issues that you have seen, like saving lives, responding uh, to a virus, and also rebuilding. And, uh, but these artifacts must be customized. They maybe must be customized for different situations. For example, a solution in New York City is not the same as solution in Nigeria. So, uh, so the, uh, the intelligence must be in the factory itself to build these solutions that are customized for the target uh, audiences. And uh, another important uh, aspect of factories is that right now there are thousands of solutions that are becoming available, but most of them are point solutions and they are, they are not integrated with each other. And many of them uh, uh, mm, uh, are not known widely beyond the a few companies that happen to know them. So, um, that's why we are adopting the idea of uh, factories because factories are a very good example. I, in the first few years of my life after getting my PhD, I worked in the manufacturing industry and, and I learned some very valuable lessons from the factories because what factories do is they build highly integrated solutions. So what you see as cars, there are millions of cars nowadays. They are much safer, uh, they are much more comfortable than the uh, cars long time ago. And the reason is that the factories, uh, the people in the factories have learned how to build integrated solutions that can be delivered to users. They may be low end users or they may be very expensive uh, um, cars, but they are highly customized 
for different type of user segments. So my idea is that why could uh, not be a, a planning system uh, like the one that we have, why could not this be configured to do something similar to building uh, actually uh, the hubs uh, that we uh, produce. So let me go directly to what exactly is it that we are trying to do. So this uh, slide, by the way, I have only three slides, so they will go very fast. Uh, I know that we are running behind in time, so I respect that. So I will make my uh, presentation short and, and to the point. So our solution approach is focusing on these smart, collaborating hubs. Let me define that very quickly what it is. Uh, first of all, a hub is a center of activity. That's it is. That's all it is. Now, a hub can be just a physical hub like a building uh, or it can be a physical hub uh, also supported by, um, by technologies like uh, very smart uh, portals and, and devices and things of that nature. Uh, or it can be totally uh, virtual or technologies, uh, a technology center. Uh, our focus is on smart hubs uh, that are heavily uh, supported by portals. And these are portals that are built for, as you can see the list there uh, for administrators. Uh, this is uh, also uh, citizen applications are provided in these hubs. Uh, training uh, materials that can uh, be used by the uh, users uh, and also by the uh, by the uh, by the possible policy makers uh, and also uh, collaborating uh, uh, collaboration capabilities so these are not just hubs uh, uh, these are not standalone hubs they have the abilities built in them so that they can collaborate with other hubs so that's a very important part of it. So that's our uh, quote unquote, if you want to uh, think about my analogy, that's the car that we are manufacturing is a smart collaborating hub. Okay. That are really customized for different users and they have these capabilities that you see listed. Well, How do we do that? Right. that on, the left, uh, on the left hand side, you see the basic idea of the factory. What does it do? It has certain steps that we go through. Uh, it takes half an hour to actually build a hub of this nature. Uh, but you know, we, we take usually about a day or so to talk to our users and things of the nature and help them train. Um, but the very first step is selection of a country and a location. So, uh, so our solution is very country and location specific. It is not, if we, for example, build a hub for Samoa, it is going to be specific to Samoa and it will not be the same uh, hub that we generate for another uh, location. Uh, second thing is uh, the P2, uh, P1, that is the one where we select the services that are most urgently needed in that particular region. Uh, the United Nations has published a uh, tremendous body of knowledge uh, uh, from the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and they tell in detail about what uh, type, what are the indicators uh, in different parts of the world, for example, uh, the deficiencies in healthcare, in, uh, in uh, education, in technologies and things of that nature. So we use those uh, indicators to recommend the type of services that will be included in in the hub. So if you say that, uh, please build us a hub in, uh, uh, and let's say in Samoa or in Thailand or Nigeria or Ghana uh, or any any of the other countries, we will look at the SDG indicators and see what are the kind of hubs that are needed more urgently in that particular area. And then we go through the process of actually doing the analysis and building the hub. So that is the, the process that we use. Uh, once again, we produce these smart collaborating hubs and they are produced through this uh, factory type of a model, uh, which specializes the solutions based on the location, based on the what kind of services that are needed urgently for that particular location. So for example, if we are building a, a hub uh, for a uh, for a village in Togo uh, where they do not have uh, a, you know a lot of technology the solution is such that it can uh, run on a very simple type of a network uh, with the text messaging 
so we do not give them the solution that requires very uh, you know fast digital networks. So that's that's the general idea. And I just want to show you now uh, the last slide, and and that that will show you that how can this particular uh, hub and these kind of hubs with their capabilities how they can be used to address the issues that I just talked about. So here you see, for example, um, the, uh, the first uh, column here is the artifacts that uh, all of these hubs have. Uh, so you can see the administrative portals, citizen apps, collaboration capabilities uh, between the hubs, uh, training materials that are produced and that are embedded into these hubs, the project management mater uh, materials and guidelines that are also uh, embedded in these hubs. And then also uh, you have, uh, you know, policies and regulations that are pertinent and important for that particular uh, hub and that particular location. So uh, how do they work for saving lives? Uh, you can see this. This is a very busy table. I'm not going to take the time to go through all of it. Uh, but uh, by the way, I should mention it that Daniela, you were, uh, and I know also Amos, you mentioned it several times also that you're all, both of you are very uh, interested in the innovation bed. Uh, so every cell of right. this table is a treasure, is yeah. a treasure for I innovator. Know. Okay. I know, I know. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you know that, right? Very well, very well. That's <laughs> okay. like we, we can, this, this can be a webinar talk, sir. <laughs> yeah, I think we, got, we are going to talk offline about it, but you can see that every one of these cells is particular area of focus for uh, innovators, for young innovators. So, uh, so in, uh, instead of them running into the walls and trying to figure out what to do for what, here are some possible opportunities for them. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, uh, so you can look at this, for example, table uh, um, also uh, in the row by row uh, to get some other insights. For example, if I just look at the collaboration capabilities uh, between the hubs. Now, when this is uh, for saving lives, this is the collaboration. These are the collaborations needed between different providers, uh, healthcare providers, also the equipment providers. So that is uh, uh, useful here. But when you go, uh, I don't know what happened here. Uh, okay, uh, just a minute. Hang on. Okay. Uh, so then similarly, you know, you can see that uh, um, that for response and control, uh, there are these are the collaboration between different administrators that may be at a local village level and how do they collaborate with regional administrators when they're administering, for example, and taking care of COVID type of operations and then the collaboration between different businesses uh, when uh, these collaborations are being used uh, between the retail stores and the electronic marketplaces and the food chains and things of that nature here to handle different type of crisis. So these are, so this, these, every one of these rows gives you some insights into how, for example, some materials like training materials, you can see how training materials can be used for the administrators, uh, of the uh, you know, life-saving efforts like healthcare workers uh, for the administrators of, uh, who are responsible for operational management uh, and also uh, you know, the courses that are needed for businesses that how they can transform their businesses from the current organization to a more digital organization uh, so that they can be more resilient. Uh, similarly, you can see the project management. So you can see, that, look at these things row by row, or you can also look at this table uh, by columns. Vertically, you can say, for example, if I am building a solution for response and control, what are all the things that I need for that? Uh, do I need, so it's not just, um, you know, having uh, social distance monitoring and supply chain and, and e-market hubs. Yes, they are needed uh, for quick response, but you also need uh, other things as you can see here that are listed. So, uh, and, and this table is by no means complete. Of course, I uh, kept it. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank uh, you so much. Diplomatically, <laughs> That's correct. High. Thank you and, so much. Thank and, you so much. And, and, and high level, <laughs> so, so that you, you can understand. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So Thank you. I am done. Thank you very much for your time. I hope this is very of value you. to you. Oh, very you. well, very much. Thank you so much. We all owe you. All right. This. And I hope, I hope, I hope the next report right. should be next report. Sorry. Yeah. I hope next report on our projects will not be about theory. I want them to be getting the data from Africa the next time we meet with the Info Property World Congress. Which yes. has, it's shifted, yeah. shifted, shifted, and shifted. This is of almost. Yeah. So. So, so yes, yes. I'm very happy about this. So Thank this you is so almost much. an operational system. So next time we'll actually give it give you a demo. Well, yes. Okay. Yeah. We're, Bye. We're, Take care. We're moving out of the lab very soon. Thank you very much, Prof. Okay. I quite yes. appreciate that. Yeah, so I have. You, you I have to go. So. Thank you very much. We, it has been a pleasure. We, we, we honor, we honor you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you All so right. much. Thanks. Right. Thanks. So Thanks. You, can, you can share your screen. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zuhir Lagdesi. Ah, mon grand, mon grand frère is my big brother from Morocco. Um, Zuhir. Oh. Zuhir. I don't know how to start. Come on, Sava. Yeah. Are you, are you with me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Comment ça va? Quelle langue est-ce que vous, vous voulez parler? Anglais ou, ou français? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we can turn on your video. Yeah, your video. Très bien. Très, très bien. Est-ce que toi? Ou, 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 ou français ou, ou anglais? Ou, anyone, please jump. No, English, English. English. Parlez, parlez no problem. <laughs> Welcome, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, for your invitation. Really, I'm uh, pleased to see you. Uh, it's been a long time. We we're supposed to meet in uh, Vienna, Austria, just some months ago, but yes. uh, unfortunately, there was this uh, pandemic. pandemic yeah, then, and, sure, uh, sure. So, what I am trying to, uh, first I just present myself, so my name is Zuhir Lakhdisi, I am, uh, um, uh, I have some companies as well in, uh, in Dubai and also in Europe, uh, Brussels, um, I, uh, I, uh, I am part of the ICT, uh, Federation here in Morocco. I, I am a member of the board and uh, I am also vice president of a cluster uh, of companies here in Morocco. And I'm partner with Innovation. Before I start uh, to talk about the topic, I uh, want to tell you the situation here in Morocco. Uh, so, uh, right now, we're around the seven. We have around 7,500 who've been uh, uh, treated and uh, now are healthy. And we have around 200 people who unfortunately died because of the, the, the pandemic. Um, the figures now are get, getting lower. So we're just today we have uh, only seven uh, people who've been infected today. So we hopefully hope that things are going to be uh, uh, going in the right direction in the coming uh, days and weeks. So um, why I wanted to tell you the story, it's also because I want also to talk about a lot of initiatives that were initiated here in Morocco uh, and that are very innovative in, in, in indeed. And um, I think it's really important because we saw a lot of people we never saw before uh, that took uh, the initiative and started to build some very interesting innovation. And that was really interesting to see during the last two months. Uh, I had the chance to participate in at least three or four of these initiatives. One of them is an intelligent mask that is that can be uh, uh, that people can wear, and it can also detect through temperature, through cough, and through other indicator person is uh, uh, have some symptoms of the COVID or not. Uh, I also participated in a project which is a chatbot using voice and dialects. Uh, that help people diagnose themselves based on uh, different uh, type of symptoms. And also I worked with the, with the government on the tracing app for Morocco, which is by the way, based on the same protocol as Singapore, but with a lot of specificities for 
African countries because we optimize a lot in terms of data consumption, uh, storage, and these kind of things because we have uh, people who don't have uh, necessarily very high-end smartphones and uh, not necessarily a good data connection. So this is just to say that there are really a lot of initiatives that we saw in the last uh, months. And uh, what happened in Morocco is that we uh, started to, that's really important. Morocco has been too much looking to France for the last years. Uh, and uh, instead of trying to build uh, their own or our own ecosystem of innovation, we try to more uh, bring innovation from other uh, countries. So now we have this change of mindset, this paradigm shift that's happened in these two months. Second thing, which is really important to understand is that now uh, we, uh, people think that science, technology and innovation are at the center of any economic developments. And people realize also that health and education need to be at the center of any social uh, developments. And uh, all of these uh, are making big change in priorities, both from governments and from the private sector. So uh, in order to, to make, uh, from my point of view, uh, this uh, happen, and in, more, in order to make what we're discussing now uh, a reality in our African countries, there are a lot of uh, things. I think uh, my friends talked about a lot of initiatives, a lot of very interesting uh, uh, ideas and uh, actions that can be made. Uh, but before I go to how I see it from the Moroccan point of view, uh, I just want to, to maybe remind that during this, uh, this uh, crisis, uh, we saw that uh, collectivist societies, uh, the pandemic, then uh, individualist soci societies. And we saw, for example, people from uh, uh, Korea, South Korea, from Singapore, from Malaysia, from these kind of countries, which are based on a collectivist uh, model of society, uh, being able more to respect the instructions given by, by authorities, being able more to collaborate in order to build um, this new model and to build the, the defense against the, the, the virus. Uh, Why, on the other hand, uh, we saw that uh, social uh, or uh, individualist society were uh, having a lot of trouble because of people, their freedom, than about uh, others' human life. So it's really important to point this uh, as an observation. There is another observation which is also important. Uh, it's that uh, the countries where innovation uh, or where technology is seen as an opportunity more than as a, a risk uh, 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 did well in terms of deploying technologies in order to help people. While countries where technology can be a threat or can have some kind of drawbacks or can constitute some risks uh, uh, were a little bit shy or not really proactive in terms of using the best technologies to help save human lives. Again, there was a debate before the start of this, uh, this webinar, and uh, I really like the point of views that was expressed by my friends, uh, Paul and by uh, Professor uh, Amjad. Uh, but I think uh, it's really one of the things that we're, we're getting now to think about is what is the value of a human, living, a human being? What is the value of life? Really? And how we translate this in terms of economic growth or in terms of economic values? And that's a really important point that we need to, to think about uh, as individuals and also as society in this specific situation. Uh, if we have someone who is dead from this virus or 10 people who are dead, is this equivalent to having, uh, I don't know, 10,000 or 100,000 or 1 million people suffering from, from the, the pandemic? And these are just, I don't have any answer. I just, I'm trying to share with you some questions that we are having right. uh, uh, as an individual I'm having and as a society. Yeah. So just maybe to tell you how I think we need to move forward after this crisis. Uh, in Morocco, we, we uh, I, first, I, I think there are four basic values uh, that are really important to build an innovation society. First one, 
is to build a trust first society. Uh, I don't think that any collaboration, any flu flow of information, of data, of knowledge can be done if trust the society we want to build. So the state needs to try to do whatever is possible in terms of, of infrastructure, in terms of digital identity, in terms of uh, law, in terms of, uh, 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 of, of fiscal measures in order to help build this trust society. Second value, uh, and again, I don't want to go into details for each of these values about the actions, but this is important just to explain how I think this can be um, uh, important to rebuild the core values of society. Second value I think is really important is collaboration. Uh, what we saw, for example, during this crisis is that for the first time of my life, I saw different ministries in Morocco with the private sector coming together and trying to build together a project. And this collaboration is not common. It's not common in our countries. It's not really common in, in Africa because there is too much competition going on between people. Even when there is no need for competition, uh, there is too much what I call ecosystem, not ecosystem, but ecosystem, uh, where people care more about what they are and what they have and how they can be at the center of things, instead of caring about how they can build together new things. So this is very important and very key. We cannot innovate without having collaboration in terms of space and in terms of time, because this is how R&D can be done. This is how innovation can be done. Third value that I think is really key and important is human centricity or citizen centricity. So we understood from this crisis that human is at the center of everything. I mean, it's, it can be important to build a lot of uh, infrastructure, a lot of things, but if at the end of the day, it, it, it cannot help human being, it can uh, live it to a, a better situation, to a better nation, it has no value. value that is really important in order to build innovation uh, society is the value creation. It's really important that society try to create value Uh, and this can be done through a lot of different things. One who is just doing intermediation, uh, buying, for example, software from, from uh, I don't know, whatever type of, of uh, big editor, American or European, and selling it in country cannot be paying the same tax as someone who is trying to work on open source software and build uh, own or uh, 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 specific software. So it's really important to focus on value creation and to uh, give opportunity to people who, to, to create value and to encourage them to do, to do so through fiscality, through economic uh, uh, finance, through, through financing, through legal and different kind of, of measures. So from my point of view, these are the core values. Again, uh, uh, we can go into detailed measures. I, I don't think we, I think it's really important in the, in the current situation. I think, uh, 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 for example, in Morocco, we're working on, uh, on artificial intelligence projects. And we're also working on AI academy. So I'm trying to build an AI academy for, for the government here in Morocco. Uh, I think in this world, which is dominated by artificial intelligence, we uh, Africans, we need to be extremely less artificial and extremely more. And thank you very much, Manuel, for the invitation. Thank you, thank you, thank you so thank you. much, Zohir. Merci beaucoup, vous êtes très fort. Right, thank you very much. Uh, that was a brilliant one, so très brilliant et extrait excellent. Um, Mr. Paul, I think Paul McDonnell will do us the uh, honor to speak for once about the strategy, the plans of Global Digital Foundation in Africa. Um, I mean, permit me to say, I've been really, I'm, I've been really blessed to have, uh, to have all these experts wake up on the top of a button. They didn't waste any time to respond to me. 
oh, look at how, I mean, professors not even minding how little I am, you know, you know, giving the honor and of course doing us good and glory to the continent at large. Uh, and I think quite a lot of content and data that we have built up here, as we are going to analyze much later on. And I trust my executive director of Global Digital Foundation is, um, is a good writer and has a whole, so much data is sitting out right now. So Mr. Paul. <laughs> thank you very much. And, uh, and thank you also for organizing this, this great event, uh, Emmanuel. It's been fantastic. And to all the other speakers who've come, it's been a great privilege to hear you and to see you and to hear what you have to say. That's right. um, I think uh, my, my instincts and my prejudice, and I think, I think this is shared by the directors of the, of the foundation, would tend to be, uh, we are in favor obviously of entrepreneurship and innovation wherever it is possible. I particularly enjoyed the presentation discussing what innovation actually is. Uh, I think uh, best way to support innovation uh, and the use of technology in uh, Africa, as indeed in other, in other parts of the world, is in, in some ways, it's to, it's to think of it as part of the normal economy. It's to see it as, as, a, as a tool that we can use to make and do things better. Uh, it presents particular challenges. Yes, it's true. Uh, there's an awful lot of paralysis, I think, um, particularly in Europe, uh, a, a, a kind of fear of technology, which is very strange, but it's, 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 it's a philosophical thing. So I, I speak again also to the need, um, and especially the need for Africa to avoid, I think, a mistake that's been made in Europe, which has been very much to overthink some of the aspects of, of technology, whereby there is a little too much regulation being deployed. I always say that Europe, Europe, Europe actually very often does ask the right questions about technology and what its impact is going to be. But speaking to its philosophical heritage, it has a morbid side. Um, and if you look at European philosophy since the beginning of the 20th century, an awful lot of European philosophy since the beginning of the 20th century is guided by a fear of technology. We see this particularly, I think, in the Frankfurt School, uh, um, a group of philosophers who were very influential, I think who remain influential on policy. These are people who had a very great fear. So I think Africa can avoid, if Africa can avoid this, the great inspiration um, in a way, the first time I kind of noticed Africa some years ago in terms of technology was, uh, and this in a way is, is, is a, a, it speaks to the definition of innovation, was the fact that the use of mobile telephones in Africa was being applied to things like payment systems um, in certain countries. And you know, the, the United States of America hadn't even got around to this. California hadn't got around to this. And it was being done in Africa because frankly it was necessary. And also there was no other legacy infrastructure there that needed to be supported. So it was kind of, it was kind of straight into you know, 21st century cutting edge mobile payments. I particularly like that, Paul. I particularly like that acknowledgement, Paul. Well, I think, I mean, I think that, 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 that thank you, Abel, uh, uh, Manuel. I think that, that um, what the future, uh, I think, for uh, te technology in Africa is going to, is going to be very dependent, obviously, on the future of its, econ of its economic policies, the future of its governance, uh, the future of its politics. Um, and all of these things, I mean, I think Africa has made great strides in recent years. It's growing. Um, and I think there are some countries in Africa who really do stand out in terms of really good policy. Um, and, you know, we as a foundation support the development of institutional capital as well as uh, technology capital uh, in Africa. Um, and I often think that there are lots of ways in, in, in Europe where we have not done things exactly the way we could have missed opportunities. I think Africa, Africa, you know, I, I say to my colleagues sometimes about Africa, I say, you know, it really, it really ought to be rich. You know, Africa should be rich. Uh, it has everything. It has everything. It's also next door to a huge market in Europe. Um, so I support the use of technology to develop countries in Africa. I also support uh, a policy if it, it, I think African countries need to be more assertive in dealing with the European Union. They need to demand access to European markets. Um, I have always been personally of the view that to refuse people access to your markets is essentially to tell them that you will not employ them. Uh, it's, it's, it's wrong. Uh, and I think Europe needs to be more open to trade with Africa. That's extremely important for Africa. You need someone to sell to. America would not be rich 
Europe itself could not be rich if it had no one to sell to. So I think we need to open our markets to Africa. That's right. That's right. So I support this in particular. So in a way, what animates me about technology in some ways is, is yes, technology is going to help us absolutely. It's part of the solution. We need to be uh, use it as we can. But by God, you know, let's let's assert our rights to trade with each other. Let's let's assert our need for a good institutional capital uh, and good political capital also. Thank you so, very much, Paul. Thank you. thank you very much, Paul. Before we go, I want to just look at our audience still there. You know, actually, this talk is not a talk for all comers. You must just be um, someone who really had that study or thought about you know policy, especially when it's digital and concerns ICTs and, and things around ICTs. Um, we have quite a lot of people still behind. We would love to listen or hear anyone that may have one or two things to share. Uh, I can still find people from Abuja. I have Houston, the United States here. I have more. Oh, yeah, I have another policy expert in the, in the house. Please, anyone, anyone with a question can throw. Any questions? Any questions? Wow. If we take some questions from the house, if we have some, because this- Can I add a comment in the meantime, Emmanuel? Okay, go ahead, please. Go ahead, Paul. Just a quick comment. I think, I think the earlier comment um, that was made about the need to train our children to think yes. and how to think and philosophy and philosophy of science are extremely important. Um, and when I was analyzing the whole AI thing in my paper, Yes. You know, I was relying very much on philosophers of science. So it's training people how to think logically about problems and training them to recognize when they're getting into traps uh, are very, very important. Um, you know, we need to know how to think clearly and learning how to think clearly is extremely important and, and quite rare. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. I'm trying to see if we have any questions. It's a full screen. Yeah, okay, madam. Uh, someone has a hand up. I want to see how to talk. Are you having any difficulty? You can talk. You can talk, madam. You can talk, madam. I'm trying to see. Oh, sorry. Oh, is she having any difficulty? Um, is there any difficulty in sound there? Oh, yeah. Uh, Emmanuel, I think people are muted. Oh, yeah. Can you please? Okay, let me confirm that. Because there are three people who are raising their hands. Oh, yeah, I can see. Let me see. Wow. What's their policy on muting? Do, 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 do. Attendees. Ah. 
If you go to participants, you may yeah, be yeah. able to. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying. I'm, that's what I'm trying to confirm. I'm, I'm somewhere there now. Right. I've unmuted myself. Okay, great, <laughs> great. Yeah, because I know that was it was a democratic button. Okay, madam, go ahead. Okay, go ahead, madam. Good, Good evening, everybody. Nice to have you all around. You're welcome, madam. Good evening. Oh. I just want to commend the presenters and the panelists so far. Thank you. Very, very informative. So I was actually trying to look out for the policy strategies that you want to propose. And I'm probably not saying so much. But not for the background information for us to think through and then to see um, opportunities to connect mm -hmm. to a an holistic policy that will help Nigeria or any other African country to make a difference. One of the things that I think is very uh, fantastic for me is the presentation by uh, Mr. Dr. Am Amjad Umar. Yeah, Umar yeah. yeah, where you mentioned that's a smart up table. I hope yeah. these uh, presentations can be shared after now. Very well, yeah. very well. Let me share. Let me share. I, I, I really think that uh, for us to drive a policy change for a digital economy, we need to be able to identify the strategies like it's been highlighted. So maybe the innovation bed um, convener will be able to pull them together and then we can see a draft for a policy action, you know that can help us to move every of the countries forward. Quite a lot of issues about the realities have been said, but for us to move from realities, I mean, from what is existing to what we want to see, we actually feel that there should be a policy drive. And for that policy to materialize, then the hair gets, the hair gets needs to come together and pull the structure on. So really for me, it's been interesting though my network has been on and off, but I've been able to listen to Daniela and uh, Daniela's presentation was very, yeah, love you guys. Daniela's presentation too is very interesting to me. Unfortunately, I couldn't get prof. Prof, I, I actually missed most of your presentation, but I, I really think that uh, because I know prof will be speaking from the Nigerian's perspective, very, and very uh, well, unfortunately, well. I missed, I was just listening to him one minute or two all through. My network was bad. But no problem. I believe uh, Mr. Amos is going to help us with the presentations. Mm -hmm. And then we can look at what is possible from different uh, countries in pulling together a strategy framework mm -hmm. that can be looked into by the stakeholders and then see a policy that can help us. But I'm particularly interested in the Umar's uh, artifacts produced and uses cases. I actually have a clip of that. <laughs> I hope Umar would don't mind one. Uh -huh, because that's nice. for me, nice. that's for me a great, uh, a great smart hub uh, plan that can be replicated by any hub or startup. So thank you very much i appreciate uh, you i appreciate you madam thank you so much uh, big brother <laughs> well, nice to see your face sir. <laughs> god bless you thank you those thank are you. my comments thank you very much madam you're welcome thank you we'll take that good morning can you hear me oh very well clearly clearly okay, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm calling from houston texas my name is i'm dr tina debo i am i'm talking on behalf of c on educational services and my interest is specifically in education. I've noticed that a lot of private schools in Nigeria have pivoted to, um, had already started pivoting to uh, um, blended learning. In fact, I came to Nigeria last year to train some schools on blended learning. But this COVID-19 situation has, has made them have to um, accelerate that. Unfortunately, there isn't a lot of equity. There are some that are already there and there are some that are, uh, many that are far behind. I've also been contacted by some um, state governors 
who are interested in, in introducing um, online learning as a part of their overall educational structure. Problem is that if there isn't, if there isn't a common, can you hear me? Hello, have you lost me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so what I, was, what I was trying to say is that if, um, as we're looking at this, if there could be a platform uh, where we can discuss how to overcome some of the infrastructure and technological dis, uh, deficiencies of the country. Um, someone was saying that uh, people don't take into consideration the rural areas, the, the, um, the people who are not uh, technologically savvy and the people who are actually not um, educated. But these, these kids have to go to school. So what are we doing about these rural areas? And I'm thinking that, that maybe creating some kind of a master satellite uh, platform for rural schools would be something that would be interest, I would be interested in exploring. I'd love to talk to the lady from the um, world, of, world of Opportunities because she was the one that was saying that if, if it's something uh, that if, I'm, if it's an innovation in education, I would like to talk to her and see how we can work together to make this happen so that we don't end with, and at the end of all this, we have an even broader gap between the haves and the have nots, between the educated and the ed uneducated, between the, the urban and the rural, because that's what I see. Even in America, they're concerned about out children in the poorer areas falling behind academically and I think that um, technology is something that, that could be an equalizer if the right policies and the right systems are put in place thank you and I'm, I, I'm Amos's sister-in-law by the way thank you okay I'm happy to look thing? forward to connect <laughs> I already sent my uh, the email okay thank you much, ma Thank you so very much. Amos, you're muted. That's Sorry, Amos, noted. I couldn't resist. That's noted. So um, we will be able to take advantage of these messages, and that will help. I'm sure uh, Paul is still on. Any more? Yeah, I'm still on. Any more? Right, great. Another industry. Um, expert now speaking to us now, um, Mr. Jido, you can, you can go ahead. Can you hear me? Hello, sir. Mr. Jido, you can go ahead, sir. Um, Oh, great, great. We can hear you now. Oh, we thought that sound was coming from Jido's hand. I will have two right now. Okay, no, no, no. Um, Jido, you can go ahead. Unmute it. Unmute yourself. You unmute yourself. Are you fine? Oh, great. Um, can um, can you try speaking? Can you try speaking? Sit down. 
It's not working. So given that all the policy challenges and the notes that we have taken today would be helpful, that that to be put together. And I think um, from Global Digital Foundation uh, and Programmers Software, uh, Programmers Foundation, uh, 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 Programmers Foundation, the promoters of Innovation Bed Africa, we give, we, we, we thank all the panelists, the keynote speaker and all the attendees and all the, all the participants. This has been great for us. It's the first time in Africa, and we were so happy at the uh, acceptance. Almost at the click of the button, a call, and even each of the countries we tapped on was able to join us. And this is the very first edition. Other numerous regional think tanks are, will be springing up based on the outcome of what we've done here today. And we give glory to God that the, the potential of the internet made this happen. We were supposed to do this physically in the United States as it was being planned. Even with the, one of the speakers earlier, my sister-in-law, Professor Amjad, and a whole lot of other people were to host me this same day in May 27th. In, um, uh, and the Heisberg University was even, they were very glad to host us. But then came the pandemic. And believe you me, 
they started made this possible. So I uh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, all. Thank, you. thank you, Daniela. Thank you. For us, say for us. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Every <laughs> other member, I'm so happy. I'm so happy to be here. I think Paul will take it up from here from our management meetings. Thank you so much. All right, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank, thank you, sir, Prof. I'm so happy, Prof. Thank you so much, so much. Everybody. Thank you. Great. Thanks. See you soon. Bye.